and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24, a show that explores the digital revolution and checks out the latest tech trends. In this edition, as French astronaut Thomas Pesquet prepares to embark on his second mission aboard the ISS, we look at what kind of experiments he'll be conducting in space. We'll also speak to NASA's Planetary Protection Officer Aileen Seesley about the risk of contaminating other planets, and vice versa, bringing back potentially harmful biological material. And in Test 24, we try Rango by the French startup GoSense. It's a clip that can turn a simple white cane into an intelligent device. It shields people who are blind or partially sighted by detecting potential obstacles. French astronaut Thomas Pesquet is set to embark on his second six-month mission aboard the ISS, but this time he'll command the Alpha mission for an entire month. During his stay on the station, he's expected to work on more than 100 scientific experiments to make the most of this unique microgravity research lab. Well, for more on this, let's turn to our tech editor, Peter O'Brien. Hello, Peter. Hi, Julia. So what kind of experiments will Thomas Pesquier be conducting in space? Well, he doesn't have much time in the day to conduct all of these because, of course, on the ISS, the sun rises and sets 16 times in one day. So it's a good thing he'll be looking at something called a sleep band. He'll be wearing this set of electrodes on his head to measure how space conditions affect sleep. It's kind of a dry run before potentially longer missions in the future. But it gets weirder because he's also going to be looking at miniature brains. So clusters of skin cells in petri dishes that grow in a similar way to how a brain does. Now we'll learn more about the effect of space conditions including weightlessness and radiation on the brain and also specifically on aging. That's why it may be useful for back down on earth. We might learn something about neurodegenerative diseases. But where it gets full Star Wars is when he pulls out this other experiment, which is acoustic pincers. So these, this is a tool which can trap a small object using ultrasound um, waves, and he'll be using this to navigate an obstacle course with these small objects. This could be useful in the future for handling delicate samples without contaminating them, or it could be useful for a variety of medical reasons as well. That's right, Peter, and he's going to be testing for COVID-19 quite a lot before embarking on that mission to make sure that he doesn't bring the bacteria aboard the ISS. And speaking of this, while we battle a pandemic here on Earth, some are actually working on making sure we don't contaminate other planets as we explore space. Each year, the National Space Council and Office of Science and Technology Policy releases a new planetary protection strategy that outlines how all space agencies intend to ensure this sustainable exploration. To talk more about it, I'm joined by Aileen Seesley, NASA's Deputy Planetary Protection Officer. Hello and welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, your job title seems to be straight out of the movie Men in Black. I'm sure you hear that a lot. Could you tell us more about the role of NASA's Office of Planetary Protection? I do hear that a lot, but it keeps the uh, job fun and interesting. Um, there are two main parts to planetary protection. The first is making sure we limit biological contamination of other worlds that are explored uh, with, our, with our spacecraft, and this is called forward planetary protection. And this enables scientific discovery now and in the future. The second part is preventing any harm to humans or the Earth's biosphere from any material brought back from the solar system exploration. And this is called backward planetary protection. So it protects Earth from any potential potential biological risk. Um, some materials are completely fine and can come back to Earth unrestricted because they have no biological risk, such as Earth's moon. But other samples are treated with caution and have restrictions to ensure that they are safely contained. And so the future samples coming back from Mars will be treated this way. So our role in the Office of Planetary Protection at NASA is to evaluate the missions that are going into the solar system to explore and make sure that they are following planetary protection protocols. Now, speaking of planetary protection protocols, how do you decontaminate spacecrafts before they re-enter the atmosphere and vice versa? How do you make sure that nothing leaving Earth will be harmful for other planetary bodies? Sure. So let's talk about the outbound trip first. Uh, some planetary bodies are not as sensitive to biological contamination as others. So for places with higher sensitivity, like Mars, for example, NASA requires that the spacecraft carries only a limited amount of biological material when they leave Earth, and the spacecraft has to meet strict cleanliness requirements. So the spacecraft is assembled in a clean room environment, it undergoes extensive cleaning, and we constantly sample and monitor the spacecraft with swabs and wipes for biological cleanliness while it's being built and tested. So when it leaves Earth, we know 
show, and we have the data that shows that the spacecraft is incredibly clean. So for the return trip, spacecraft returning to Earth experience very high levels of, of radiation and high heating in the atmosphere uh, when, they, when they're returning to Earth. But for spacecraft bringing samples back from places like Mars, they have to be designed special to ensure the samples are contained in several layers of protection and they return to Earth safely. Now, more precisely, Aileen, how do you handle alien bacteria and how do you evaluate the risks of greater terrestrial contamination? For new material samples that are going to be brought back from places like Mars, they're going to be treated with the highest biological security until they are verified to be safe through, through scientific studies and tests. And this is why planetary protection and keeping spacecraft and all of the surfaces that touch these samples clean is so important. It helps the scientists that are doing these studies uh, understand and limit terrestrial contamination so they can separate out what they know came from Earth from any potential biological signal that came from something that, that, that could have come from Mars. Now, Eileen, in the wake of the renewed space race and the fact that many private companies are also contributing to putting more and more technologies into orbit, do you ever feel that things could get out of control and that you could no longer be able to protect Earth from contamination? Well, all of our uh, uh, industry partners, they are partners with us. Uh, NASA utilizes uh, many, many uh, stakeholders and has many partnerships to enable our missions. And so because of that, we work hand in hand in a very collaborative nature uh, with uh, all of our spacecraft provider uh, providers. For example, the uh, new providers that are helping us return to exploration on the moon in preparation for in the future going to Mars. So all of these explorations and all of these studies and tests of using the, the moon as a test bed is enabling us to plan for future, future human missions to Mars. Aileen Cecily, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on Tech24. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Now I'm going to turn to our tech editor again. Recently, uh, Aileen Cecily touched up on it, but a scientist discovered new types of bacteria aboard the ISS. What happened there? Yeah, so five years ago, about around five years ago, astronauts swabbed different parts of the ISS and they sent these samples back down to Earth. NASA has recently revealed that they contained three strains of a completely new type of bacteria unknown to science before. It's the Methylobacterium agmalii, and it was likely carried up there, as she said, by astronauts or cargo and didn't come from outer space. But it turns out it's got some very interesting characteristics nonetheless. So it's very helpful for the growth of plants and it can withstand very extreme conditions. So extreme uh, radiation, extreme dryness. That's why they've nicknamed it Conan the Bacterium. Um, it's been a promising development actually for the search of bacteria that might help us thrive on Mars because we know that it can survive in the closed environment of a spaceship which prompts us to think that it could withstand long interpla interplanetary travel and it could potentially turn that sterile dust on Mars into potting soil for us to create our food. Now this time around it was actually a, a bacteria from Earth, but what about if we're, if we're alien bacteria? Uh, we actually faced that prospect once before after uh, the Apollo 11 mission landed uh, in the middle of the, the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, it might well have been a close call in fact. And, it, it's an experience that many of us can relate to now, what the astronauts of Apollo 11 had to go through when they came back to Earth. So Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins and Neil Armstrong, you can see them here back down on Earth. They had to quarantine for 21 days in this metal box. Here's President Nixon saying hi to them. Now, of course, this was the first time anyone had come back from the moon and it was one of the pre precautions put in place to make sure no potentially dangerous germs got out into the Earth. However, just before this, they obviously landed in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the command module. At which point, what did the rescuers come and do? Well, they just popped the hatch right open and any of the germs could have just gone into the Earth. That so it was indeed a close call. Thank you, uh, Peter, for that. We're going to move on now to Test 24. After looking at some assistive headsets for partially sighted people back in February, we've got yet more assistive tech with us here on the set of Test24 this week. Peter, tell us more about this white cane that can become a connected object with just a clip. Yeah, that's right. So this little gadget here is called Rango by the French company GoSense. And as you can imagine, obviously a simple white cane can only really feel around in front of you at floor level. So what this does is it clips on 
and it's got these three ultrasound uh, detectors that can sense any obstacles above floor height that are coming your way and will feed back into an earpiece sound in 3D space so you can almost hear the obstacles coming before you hit them. Now, do you have uh, other examples of innovations in this sector, in this uh, smart yeah, cane business? Absolutely. There are a few of them. The biggest one is probably smart cane uh, by WeWalk. So it comes with its own cane, or you can screw off the handle and attach it to your own. Now, this one also detects obstacles using ultrasound, but alerts you by vibrating with a haptic motor rather than using sound. It pairs up with their rather smart app, which um, gives you all sorts of navigation to nearby places. Places. I talked to one of the founders, Kershat Jalan, to ask him why this cane is better than a normal one. As a visually impaired person, I'm still relying on my white cane, which is just a plain stick. And with WeWalk, we are changing this situation uh, and uh, providing more developed technology for visually impaired. Uh, right now, WeWalk gives overhead obstacle detection, provide turn-by-turn -turn navigation, gives information about public transportation timelines, as well as provides information about restaurants, cafes, uh, stores, while we are passing by. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for presenting us with useful tech. Thank you for that. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. You can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you soon.